Hi, everybody. Uh, what a privilege it is to be here tonight, uh, especially being before Stephen Hawking. Patty, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm here to speak to you tonight about what uh, Stephen was talking about, that is the future of the human race. And it's something that I think is pressing. In fact, I invested the $100 million in Kernel because I believe that we are about to enter into the most consequential revolution in the history of the human race, and specifically that we were going to build the tools to read and write our neural code so that we can take control of our cognitive evolution. So before I get into this, I want to tell you a little bit how this got started. It actually was 20 years ago when I was in Ecuador working as a Mormon missionary, living among extreme poverty for two years. I returned back to the States and I had this overwhelming desire to try to improve the lives of others. I looked around at the options I had and I couldn't really find anything I thought was a fit. So I thought, you know what? I'll become an entrepreneur. I'll make a whole bunch of money by the age of 30. Then with all this money and freedom of time, I'll go do something useful. In my naive 21-year-old mind, and lucky me, it happened. I sold my company Braintree to PayPal in 2013. With a fresh perspective, I got to ask this question. Now I'm in this privileged position. I have the money. I don't need the permission of anybody to do what I want to do. What do I do? And the question was, how do I create the most value for the human race? So I surveyed the world. But before I get into it, let me get a fill of all of you here. When you look at the future and you think about all the problems we have, but all of the wonderful things we have going on, how many of you think, you know what? We've got this. Like, we can solve this. Show of hands. Okay. Second question. How many of you look at the same set of problems and challenges? and say, ah, I don't really know if we can do this. Show of hands. Okay, I'm with this latter group. I think the data does show that the world is getting better. We've never had less violence. The standard of living's never been higher. We're generally trending in the right direction. But I think the future is complex for a number of reasons. One is I think the pace of change is accelerating. That creates stressors on our society things we have to deal with you otherwise didn't have. When things move really fast, it puts us in a difficult spot. And number two, emergent complexity. It's becoming increasingly hard to manage our society. So the only image that comes to my mind is I think the future is kind of like a Category 5 hurricane that's going to bear down on us with so much force. And I have images of leave, having it leave us without power and water and be able to cooperate. The single greatest thing we can do as a species is to work on our adaptability, our ability to evolve with this change. Now, when I went through these problems, I assessed the world and I formed my conclusions, but I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm off. Like, maybe I really don't understand the reality. So I thought, I'll do the most reasonable thing anyone would do. I asked my seven-year-old daughter, baby, what's on your mind? What do you think about the future? And we got this list. Can we have? There we go. So number one of her concerns, monsters. Number two, her parents dying. Well, I guess that's me. Three, our, our snake Nagini coming back to life, who happens to be in the walls uh, dying, sadly. Uh, fourth, uh, animals taking over the world. Now, why does she think this is the case? Because monsters want to kill us, kill her, and take over the world because they want to be rich, to have a slide in their backyards, have bumpy cars, and then force people to play with them. <laughs> now, this seems cute and funny, but when I started thinking about her concerns, I actually found that my concerns are pretty similar to hers. Let's take monsters, for example. I, too, am scared of monsters, just not monsters under my bed, monsters inside my head. My father suffered from drug addiction for the first 25 years of my life. My stepfather has signs of Alzheimer's. It's devastating to watch someone you love lose their humanhood right before their eyes. And three, I suffered from chronic depression for a decade. I wanted, with the greatest amount of intensity I could explain, to just cease to exist. 
I had children, and that wasn't a way out, but I can tell you I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Number two, parents dying. I too am scared about dying. I grew up in this Mormon household where I was told there's a God, and this God has a plan, and if you obey the rules of this God, you get this amazing afterlife. It was an amazing deal, so I obeyed the rules. And as I grew older, I decided, I don't know if I believe this anymore. And I had this shocking realization where I had to reconstruct my existence from scratch. Why do I exist? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? Now it's all in my responsibility to create this life to be as amazing as possible, not the next life. Number three. <laughs> Number three, Nagini coming back to life. Even though the ball python was, well, in the wall, we recognize this fear as things we don't see, things that come back to bite us, things that blindside us, things we create in the name of progress, such as social media, that come back and influence the elections for an undesirable outcome. And four, animals taking over the world. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for Stephen Hawking to have spoken about AI. 2017 kind of seems like the year where we all became a little frantic about the realization that AI may take over the human race. And I don't think those concerns should be discredited. I think we should be very thoughtful about these things. At the same time, I personally am much more concerned about human behavior than I am about AI. The power for a single individual to create a bioattack, to knock us off the electrical grid, is devastating. We cannot let singular individuals create so much destruction in society. And so, in fact, in thinking this through, in Stephen Hawking's discussion. I drew this little picture on a napkin this morning. Let me see if I can pull this up. So whatever you believe about AI, let's say you believe that the growth of AI is up and to the right. Let's say you believe it's more in a linear curve. Let's say you think it's punctuated equilibrium or start and stops. Whatever you believe, you can say it's up and to the right. If we look at human ability, it's flatlined. We have gone from clubbing each other with stones to shooting each other with automatic weapons. So at what point in time do we look at the difference between the capability set of our tools, or AI, and our own abilities and say, we feel really uncomfortable with this? And how much lead time do we need from making that realization that it might make sense to make our own evolution, our ability increase, the number one priority of the human race. So in thinking about all this, the problems we have in the world, the things we have to go about doing it, this is why I've started Kernel. When I looked at the world and I tried to assess who's investing in the brain, who's trying to improve its abilities, who's putting the capital there, is the government doing it, are entrepreneurs doing it, are venture, are venture capitalists funding it? How often do we talk about it? I, in fact, had 12 dinners over the past year. And I would start the, the dinners and say, let's imagine we're living in the world 2050. And we're very happy. We've made this, we built this remarkable world. What did we focus on in 2017 that allowed us to build this amazing world? And without fail, I got the same answers every time. Climate science, education, AI, security. The same answers every single time. But you know what? Not a single person mentioned the brain. Yet everything we are, everything we build, and everything we aspire to become stems from the brain. So why is the brain such a blind spot in our society? Kernel's an attempt, a first attempt at trying to make a dent in the tools we build today. So what is the state of play? What could we do? We have MRI machines to image our brains. We have EEG to record, to meditate. We have a TDCS to stimulate for addiction. These tools are amazing. I don't mean to belittle them at all. But they, don't, but they are far lacking the power we need to read and write our cognition. So when I say that, what does that mean? Like, what are some examples to make that tangible? 
Imagine if I had a tool to interface with my brain where I could walk a mile in someone else's shoes. What if I could feel what it was like to be you? What if I could understand your contextual framework? What if I understood your memories and your emotions? Would that change the way we deal with each other, the way we cooperate, the way we make decisions? Would that change our creative ability? What if instead of destroying our enemies, we destroyed the concept of enemies? And what if our imaginations on the potential of our own cognitive abilities was much like the 1800s, where if you went there and you said, sir or madam, could you please tell me, could you please give me a rousing speech on the potential of electricity? What will it power one day? They probably would have said, lights? That's the key. Our imagination constrains us with what we're familiar with. Now, in building these technologies, and in any revolution, it is not guaranteed that things are going to go well. We've seen that happen many times. Revolutions come, windows open up, the old is pushed aside, and a new narrow window is opened up. So how might we be thoughtful in building these technologies? Let's give you one example. When I use Facebook today, I log in and I socialize my friends and my family. In exchange for that, they acquire as much data as they possibly can about me. They know me better than my girlfriend. And that's the same relationship I have with Google and Twitter and the government, who is also collecting everything they can about me. I really dislike this relationship. Now let's imagine if we have these interfaces and we're streaming our thoughts and our secrets and our imaginations and our fantasies in real time. I really dislike that relationship. So what if we had the power of these tools and what if we could drop these things in the blockchain? And what if we said that human data privacy was a human right? And that in doing that, we leverage these tools to recreate societal structure on trust, security, to work against things like terrorism or mass shootings. Where if you are represented by the blockchain and you are secure with all your information and you give permission to others, but then people build algorithms of security to hit your blockchain and say, is this person safe to enter Web Summit? We can rebuild it. The idea that a centralized government can keep society safe is insane. We have to rebuild these fundamental architectures. So two final thoughts. One is we have broadly agreed as a society that we respect reading and writing as a fundamental need for all of us. It allows us to communicate, cooperate, share information. There's another form of literacy that we need as a society, and that is future literacy. So I was, with, I was recently in Saudi Arabia with a gentleman. He was telling me about his 20, 30 goals for his country. And I thought, that's amazing because that's 13 years away. The world's going to change 100 times over between now and then. And I said, let's, let's play a game here. Let's imagine that we have a robot. We're trying to get it to the, to the far end of that, of that sand hill over there. And so we program the robot. We do a topographical map of the area, and it programs to wind its way through the sand to get to that point. The problem with that plan is the moment the robot begins, the sand shift, and now the robot's stuck. The better way to do it would be to say, we build the robot, we get the sand dune, and we program the robot to respond in real time to anything that comes its way. So no matter how the sand shift, it can move and hit the endpoint. We as a society need to become that adaptable. And the key to becoming that adaptable is building this baseline tool of technologies and cognitively intervening. So in short, a revolution on the scale of something we've never seen is coming. It's going to be on our front doorsteps in 15 to 20 years on a scale we've, we've never seen before. A window's going to open up, and we're going to have a shot at building something remarkable. And once we build it, it's going to close. So I'm going to go home to my daughter. I'm going to say, baby, I know you've got a lot on your mind. I get it. Monsters are scary. Nagini's in the wall. Animals taking over. I, I hear you. But guess what? I'm working on these things, and I just talked to 15,000 people in Lisbon, and they're working on it too. And guess what? We'll do this. So let's not fuck this up. Thank you. <laughs>